All right, everyone, welcome back. So day two of week five. Um, there's a homework this week. Last week, there was no homework, but there's a homework this week. Let's review it. And then we'll get today's code. So the week five is first code check-in. On this particular week, we have a deadline. Oops, I have to change the date on that. Let me do that right now, actually. As usual, things are due on Tuesday, so you have all of the chance possible to get help. And other class, things are due on a Sunday, but for us, we've got it on a Tuesday. And so what we need to do right here is we're going to see about the uh, this week's work. By now, you should be applying the code that you learn onto your own project. The things you're learning in the lecture, you're gonna apply them on your own idea. Remember, a few weeks ago, you did your own uh, setting up a project assignment. You started to set up your own project with your own ideas and such. And it's not complete at all, of course, and those have been graded, but you were creating the various scenes and just you know temporary content well, you should start to now be applying what you're learning in class now. Um, note, what I've got noted here is, okay, you're going to be your uh, week three starting point file into a new folder, week five. And you're going to rename the week three to week five and then start adding the material here. Well, this is the material from last week. So you're gonna add what we learned last week. If you want to add what we learned this week, you could, but you have to, for the grade, at least have what we learned last week. And last week was a simple button that would move you to the different screens. We have an example of interacting with something that gets animated once you tap it. There's dead end interactivity you interact with something and it just wiggles nothing happens and then the hit detection in our case was the rock hitting the window those are all the things we covered last week example code is on canvas and now what i need to see is these four things added to your project which you started on week three with your own character with your own idea the things from last week. Okay, the things from this week. Well, that was the uh, moving the painting three times so that it falls and then you pick up an item to your inventory. Today will be a mini boss with hit points and such. Okay, the things of this week, if you add them to the homework, that's fine, but they are not going to count for the homework. What's going to count are the things from last week. You have to add the things from last week. And if you add the things from this week, great. But if you do the things from last week and not the things from last week, not great. I'm not grading on any of the things from this week. This week are the pick up an item, the boss, a little interact, a little randomness that we'll look at too. So that should not be confusing. Obviously, if you need help, ask me, ask the assistants, ask in the chat, ask in the lab time. But that's the idea. You need to apply what we learned last week to your empty week three project. The lectures of how to do all of that are on Canvas. The example code are on Canvas. And spoiler alert, what we're learning this week. And then next week, there'll be a homework on that. Second code check in. So the things we're learning this week. 99% chance will be applied to a homework in one or two weeks. And there's still plenty to learn, of course. But then if you look at the grand scheme of things, then the semester ends. Let's see, when does the semester end again? Like the first week of August, I think. Second week, maybe. We'll see here. August 1st. So if you look at a calendar, we're barely starting July. July 3rd is today. August 1st is technically when the class ends, although that's a Thursday. I'll explain that later. 
But basically the first week of next month is when the class ends, four weeks, five weeks, whatever that is. So we're going to have this week's homework. Next week, no homework. We're learning stuff, of course. The week after that, there will be the homework. And in two weeks, it'll be the second code check-in where you're going to apply what we're going to be learning into your project. 15 points due by Tuesday. So you've got the lab time today. One more on Monday, then it's due on Tuesday. And it's applying what we learned last week to your project. Questions and comments on that. There's the grading. There's a few that are, well, there's one that you did it or not. And there's others that have uh, partial grading. So um, this week, I'm going to continue where we last, last left off with the code. My project is already in Animate. You should, as soon as you come into class, set yourself up if you wish. Uh, I'm not going to be going through the same steps over and over. Open your file, save as, etc. You should be able to do that on your own now. But in my case, my project, just to remind us where we're at, two whole days ago. So... We've got our title screen where we can go to help, which will be completed at some point. If you saw my example project, there's also an exit button that we never talked about, and we'll talk about it eventually, of course. What if I want to exit the game? Because, of course, this is running eventually on a real device, and maybe you want to exit the game. So I want to have a way to exit the game. We'll add that later. Help screen needs to be filled in, of course. This is where at some point you will have your character or an animation or just plain text or something. The title screen, of course, on mine is incredibly simple. You probably at some point after we're finished with the coding want to add the polish of um, a nicely designed front screen and uh, clouds uh, moving around and whatever. And buttons that probably look nicer than these scribbles. The game starts. It's a static screen. Again, we're going to add, once we're done with the code, we're going to add our character. We're going to add a character cutscene. There's going to be a character cutscene before the scene starts. Uh, we'll get to that later. We've got one interactive element. You tap it, animates, and then it takes you to a new screen. We saw all of this, where we interact with these screens that are dead ends. Hit detection is the important part. The main house. And of course, the last thing we did was we interact with something X number of times. And then after X, then that reveals something for your inventory. And we're at, for today, we're going to move to the right screen. We're going to have a door that takes us to the next scene. But before we can open the door, there's going to be a boss that appears that we have to defeat. If we can't defeat the boss in time, game over. It'll be the first instance of going to the game over screen. We cannot get out of the room until we beat the boss. So if we try to go forward or back, we can't until we beat the boss. Once we beat the boss, then that unlocks going back or going forward. That's where we're at for today. So that is happening on the scene right path, hall one. Last time, the last thing that I did was I set up the non-interactive environment. Made a new layer for the interaction, the interactive elements. There's going to be a door Drawing it very obviously, of course, in my regular uh, game and aesthetic, it might not be so obvious, but because we're going to turn it to a symbol, when something is a symbol, it can be edited infinitely, and then any copies of it on screen will change. That's a, one of the great reasons to use symbols, make a change in the symbol, and all instances also change. That door that I just drew, I need to turn it into a symbol. 
eight. This is a sprite. It will be, I guess, hallway. Let's see how we're doing this one. Front, front. We've already gone to the right. Okay, uh, sprite, right, path, uh, door. All these things can be named as you wish, but the logic for me, what makes sense is that the things that are on the right path have the prefix of right on the right side of the house, and then its specific name. It's a door. SP for sprite. It's a graphical element. If it was an audio element, I might put, you know, MUS, music, music main, music dead end, music good ending. If it was um, something related to text that is appearing on screen, I might prefix it TXT. This is text on the ending of good. You know, lots of ways to do this. But here's how I'm naming this. And the rotation point, if you leave it as is, that's fine. But usually you want to rotate things from the center. Important. Oops, okay, I did something here. When I selected it, okay, when I selected it to make it into a symbol, I accidentally also selected parts from my other layer. So I got to undo several times there, actually. Because I, I forgot to lock the background layer. There we go. I should that first. Uh, so the, the elements are going to be um, on their own separate layer so that they can be created and interacted with. And uh, I didn't lock my layer. It's always a good idea to lock your layers that you're not editing. Because what I did was right here, I made a selection of the elements. And then when I over selected, then what happened was I over selected. So I'm going to select that item, then I'll turn it into the symbol. And then I'll call that sprite right door. Now on that, it's its own element that is not connected with the other items on accident. And that needs an instance name. So here's a mistake people make often as a beginner. You create the object and turn it, you create the drawing and turn it into a symbol, but then you forget to give it an instance name. So my properties here, instance name, I'll call it similar to what my name is in the library. Right door, don't forget to press enter on that. That can be animated, of course, later. And now that has a an instance name. The idea that's gonna happen here is um, we, of course, in our mind, know in general what our game is but when someone plays the game for the first time they're learning to play it and even if it's a kind of a game that they might have played before they have to learn it every time therefore that's why we're going to have those cut scenes where our character will appear for a moment and give a little bit of a hint or a little bit of plot now, we're going to come to this screen. We're going to kind of look around for a moment. A person will probably want to open the door, but the door will be locked, and then the boss will appear, and we have to battle the boss. So in our code, we currently have it set up that we've got a stop, and maybe the message of trace and we're going to make a note here on that first stop. Stop is temporary. It's later. Things are going to be a little different here. We're not going to go just directly into the scene and start interacting. We're going to have a little bit of animation and then interactivity. For the moment, for the coding, we're going to add a stop so that the timeline does not play. 
But once we add the later code, we need to remove that stop so that an animation plays. That's my note there. We'll remove it later. I'll also make another note here, remove, so that I don't forget, so that we don't forget. I want that door to be interactive. But the door, the interactivity of the door is going to be based on the mini boss. I cannot open the door until I defeat the mini boss. So we're going to introduce some logic here. If the boss is dead, open the door or have the ability to open the door. If the boss is not dead, do not have the ability to open the door. So keep track of if mini boss is defeated or not. Creating a variable, just like before, making decisions. So with this variable, let's call this call right mini boss. Now we may have more than one also, so I'll also prefix it with a number or mini boss A, etc. All right, mini boss dead one which is a type of Boolean, and it is false. Just got to this part of the game. The mini boss is about to appear. It is not dead. So the starting point Boolean value is false. It's not dead yet. Set up interaction with the door based on uh, mini boss. This will just be the usual event listener function, but it's gonna then also relate to the uh, true falseness of it here. I'm gonna copy an example of my code from any other previous interactivity. Uh, as usual, I'll just grab it from the title where I had those two bits of code there. So once again, there's that, something that I'm interacting with, which will give me some result. The result is here seen that before. So the name of my door, I probably just called it hall door, right? A right door. So it's right door. Right door is now interactive. When I try to interact Play some function, function go, it'll go to the next scene. So right here, let's see the next scene. Um, we'll make it obvious here, we'll change it later. Function go ending. Next screen here is gonna be an ending. And so our function will reflect that. This is going to be one of the first screens where we're going to be able to get to an ending. Of course, I want to go to be able to, you know, 50 screens of the game, but at least we want to kind of understand a little bit about moving around and so forth. And then when I have those ideas, then I can add 50 screens. And these functions, of course, uh, can be named as you wish. As usual, I'll break apart this curly brace right here, give it a name. And trace just to make sure it's interactable. My code is correct. We've done this several times, but it's a good idea to save my code and test my code just in case, even though nothing is really new here. I've done this before. So I'll take a quick moment to test it. If 
starting, going through the front door, breaking the window. I'll go directly to the right side over here. And all that I'm checking is if I tap that door, yes, I'm getting feedback down on the uh, output panel. And um, again, that's nothing, that's nothing new. We've set up before a listener for an object and then reaction, nothing new. But it's a good idea, especially as a beginner, to stop and test your code uh, here and there just to make sure. Um, what we should also do is because this is going to be based on if the boss is dead or not, we should trace to ourselves if, uh, you know, the state of that variable. So what I'm going to do at this point after I added the boss here, I'll just trace that also. Is boss is mini boss dead? So we're asking, is mini boss defeated? Um, and then this will say the true or the false. Whenever we create a variable and we reference it, we reference its name, it will tell you the value in the variable. We've seen that before. And this is just, again, for our testing purposes. When I teach programming, I usually overdo it in terms of you don't need the as many trace statements as I usually teach. But I think as a beginner, it's very useful because, again, action scripts will tell you when you did it wrong, but it won't tell you when you did it right. So you are in the right word path hallway. Is mini boss defeated? False. Well, of course, I just got to the screen. The variable was created in this scene. It was set to false. Nothing has changed it to true yet. The way we're using that is now when we try to uh, actually interact with the door, we're going to check, is mini boss dead or false? So continuing with this function right here. Oh, can you be a little bit quieter there, please, Gil? So what we're going to do here is we're going to check the uh statement right here with another conditional statement another if else we've seen these before decision i will break this apart into multiple lines for readability and make a note of the ending of that just to Remind myself, this is end of if else. Checking if mini boss defeated. The trace over here will be true. Boss is defeated. Versus false. Boss is not defeated. Right there. So as usual, we're going to make a decision. Has this been done yet or not? Has the boss been defeated? Yes or not? And that's going to come from the variable of hall right mini boss Ted zero one. Right there. Hall right mini boss Ted zero one. So that is either a true or false. Technically, what we could do is say this. If what is inside of this variable is exactly true, okay, true, the boss is defeated. What's inside this variable is false. Is that is false exactly the same as true? No. So it would go to the false portion. What I meant about technically, this is a little bit more obvious. Technically, it could also just be set up that way without actually asking, is one greater than two? There's a way to ask a question here that is just true false uh, by putting just the variable. This is kind of advanced, so I'll leave it as what we've learned before. Is this the same as that? Is this greater than that? Is this less than that? 
So I'll keep it this way. The code's not done yet, but just to test it, just to see if that true falseness is working. I go to that scene and then I interact with the door. That code will run. Okay, so we're here on this part, rightward path, mini boss defeated. If I interact with the door, okay, my go is running, false. It's not defeated yet, obviously. But the point is I'm triggering the if else now. Moment that I interact with the door, check. Is the boss defeated true or false? If it's true, show that code. If it's false, show that code. Well, the way we're going to change that is by battling the boss, which we'll do in a moment. But just to um, just to just to test things, sometimes it's valuable for you to change your code. Um, hall right, boss dead is equal to false. We've said it. So it will always trigger else. If you just want to check that your true is working, well, up on the top, temporarily, I'm going to change that to true. And this is sort of over testing things, but perhaps as a beginner, it's valuable to think about over overdoing things. People often ask, well, how do I get good at programming? How do I, you know, you seem to know a lot. How do you do it? Sometimes it's just doing it over and over, trying different things, going beyond what you've learned, just trying things. If you make a mistake, there's undo. Just undo it. So by making that little change there, I'm triggering true. That's all I wanted to check. Nothing special, but yeah. That is to show that this true and false will work, of course. After we defeat the boss, we want to then move to the next scene under true. Say first check boss defeated. Then us to next scene or else not defeated. So keep us here on this scene. If we do defeat the boss, well, that's just going to be a plain old move us to another screen. Flip this route, go to and play. First frame of another scene, scene. Else doesn't need to do anything, although I could set it up later, that it plays a sound, that it does different things. But here it's making a decision based on if we confirm the boss is defeated, move us to the next scene. Or else the boss is not defeated, do something else. Maybe I'll add the note here. A to do item, play a sad sound. Something, make the phone vibrate, whatever to do, um, to do thing for later. Now, again, just to test it, I'll temporarily put defeated into true. Well, set it to true just to see if that works. It, this is nothing new. We've made code to move from scene to scene, but now it's based on true false. Just to do a quick test, I will try to go through the door. Try to go through the door. Went. True boss is defeated, I went to the next screen. I have nothing on the ending screen, but I went to the next screen. Oh, 
All right, make sure that's a false. Obviously, when the when we get to this screen, this boss has not been defeated yet. So that must be a false or else you'll get a logic error. It's not going to pop up to give you a, a syntax error. There's nothing wrong syntactically. You wrote the code properly. This will be a logic error if you don't set that to false. The boss is not defeated yet. Therefore, the AI will not work properly. So make sure it's false. All right, well, defeating the boss is also going to be related to our animation. As I said, we're going to get to this scene. After a moment, a boss will appear, start coming at us. And there's going to be a time limit. There's a couple of ways to do time limits, one through code and one through the timeline. Both give you the same result in the end. I'm going to do a timeline. I'm going to do a, time, a countdown, a timer, based on the timeline. When the timeline goes to a certain frame, time's up. You don't defeat the boss by the time runs out. Bad ending. There's going to be a time limit here to defeat the boss to be able to go to the good ending or the next scene. Again, just to kind of get version one of things we're going to be able to get to the ending already here. Obviously, when we, depending on our time and such, we'll make, you know, seven more screens. But for the moment, if within the time limit we defeat the boss, we go to the good ending. So um, I want in total, we'll figure out a good time later, but in total, we're going to make it short for the moment, too short, two seconds. Um, we're running at 24 frames per second. 24 times two is um, 48, two seconds. So I will add frames until frame, I'll just round it up, frame 50, background until frame 50. And then the code, a blank keyframe on frame 50. So there will be a time limit here of 50 frames, which is two seconds. Again, this is too short, but just for testing purposes, I'm gonna have a very short time limit. To defeat the boss in two seconds. Once we get to two seconds, blank keyframe on my code layer, and my code there will be time ran out to bad ending. Movie clip this route, go to and play frame one of the bad ending. Scene and bad. But here's one of a few ways to make a time limit. Once we get to this scene, it will play. Time's running out till you get to frame 50. Once it gets to frame 50, it triggers the code there. Go to the bad ending. You didn't defeat the boss in time. If we defeat the boss in time, of course, we'll be able to stop the timeline so that we don't trigger frame 50. This is one of a couple of ways we will do a timer. Now that is why we then no longer want that stop at the very first frame. I want to move into this screen, start the timer. Therefore that stop there is not what we want. Read it or comment it out. Let's see here, if I test my code, and I go to the right hallway. Timer started, five, four, three, two, one, and then it ended. It automatically took me to the bad ending. It's exactly what I told it here, once we when from this hallway, we went to the right. Well, in the code, we said very, very simply, when you tap on the right, 
on the right path, the right path, go to and play timeline of the right path. The right path, the scene on the right, right here. There's no stop command. This is one of the few places where we don't want a stop command at the very beginning. So this code triggers, it's running in memory. The timeline keeps running on its own, counting down five, four, three, two, one. When it gets to frame 50, it runs this code, take us to the bad end, you didn't do it in time. In case I didn't have anything really visible there in the bad ending. Drawing right here. It's your tombstone. Time limit is based on the timeline running out. To the right, timer starts, two seconds, game over, didn't defeat the boss, bad ending. Well, in order to avoid the bad ending, I want to open the door. But I can't open the door until I defeat the boss. Set up a boss here. Um, as, I've, as I've said, the um, interactive elements should be on their own layer. But... Case also, I'm going to put the boss on its own layer because it's going to animate. Um, it's going to start at the end of the hallway and come at us. So that is going to animate coming at us. And along with the inline happening here. I'm going to lock my interactive layer, make a new layer, call it mini boss one. Start on frame five, frame 10, uh, like about half a second of pause, like someone gets to the screen, they kind of pause for a moment. Then on frame 10, moving forward, the boss will appear. Again, two seconds is way too fast to try to defeat this boss. I'm putting it at a short amount of time just to make sure it works. And then when it works, I can make the time longer. I just add more frames. So I want to pause for about 10 frames. Then a blank keyframe on frame 10 of its own layer. I'm going to draw a, a boss over here. Get better later, animated and sounds and all that good stuff. But I'm adding a boss. Won't appear right away. The timeline will start here. Then I'll move forward. Then it'll appear. Then it'll come at us. Turn that into a symbol. Right. Mini boss one. Instance name, mini boss one. Shrink it a little bit to put it near the end of the hallway. On frame 50, it's going to come at us. This will be a plain old tween. We haven't used those in a while. But I just very simply come at me. Well, it's going to be small at a distance and big close up. It's a keyframe F6. Bring it closer to me and make it larger. At a distance, it's close. In my case, the perspective, the way I drew it. In between, of course, right click, create a uh, 
classic tween. Yeah, classic tween. So when we get to the scene, we've got a little bit of a pause. It appears at a distance. Obviously, I would animate it that it, it comes out of the door and locks the door behind itself and whatever, all this cool stuff. For the moment, though, it appears, starts coming at us. There's the time limit, which coincides with how many frames I've got there. Obviously, if I want it to come at us slower, I need more frames. Obviously, if I want the countdown timer to be more reasonable than just two seconds, I would add more frames. But this is now coinciding with the time limit. Right? Little pause coming at us way too fast. And then we're dead. And we didn't have a chance to really see what's going on. When we're writing the code and working with the project, okay, in our mind, it, it all makes sense and is timed properly. But obviously here, that happened way too fast. What happened? Suddenly I'm dead. Game over. We would want more time, but just uh, to make sure our code works, it's going to happen fast. And then we're going to uh, uh, add more time. But you see, the idea is it's coming at us. It defeated us. Bad ending. Well, we need to fight back. So the, um, I'm going to tap the boss, just the simple tap it, defeat it, weaken its hit points and so forth. Then the time limit. And we can set that it's got, you know, five hit points, 50 hit points, etc. Well, uh, my particular character, it has a higher defense power and attack power than the other selectable character. Yeah, there's lots and lots of things we could add on top. Uh, we're starting, of course, simple version 1.0. Uh, as we go through the weeks, we will then go back and add the more advanced stuff. But at the very least here, tap the boss within the time limit to defeat it. So the very similar, something to interact with. Every time we tap it, play some code, we'll have some code within the code of the boss. We'll also have the if else. If you've hit the boss enough times, it's defeated or else it's not defeated. So we will do something very similar for the boss. And another variable, now this time to keep track of hit points. And either do it that we've got, okay, 10 hit points that we lower to zero or We've hit the boss zero times, and now we have to hit it 10 times. So you see there's the two ways to do the same thing. Hit points lowered to zero, or hit amount raised to 10, whatever way we want. After the last code, we'll say um, track the boss hit points. It's a variable. My previous variable I called hall, right, boss, dead, etc. This one I will call it all right mini boss hp hit points i'm going to do it in the way of uh going from zero to x i have to hit the boss 10 times 50 times so we're going to count from zero to 50. of course we could do it from 50 to zero it's just a matter of is this less than that or is this greater than that either way but we'll do it when hit points are greater than 10 you defeated it when hit points are greater than 50 you defeated it you could do it. When hit points are less than zero, you defeated it. Set up, tap, also known as uh, battling. Boss. So it's the same about though that code from before. Same code as before. Once again, as I said in the beginning of this semester, yeah, we have 500 lines of code, but it's not like 500 original commands. Yet again, I'm using that pair of commands. I'm just changing the, the one detail here. Yet again, I'm creating a way to keep track of something. 
just like I did earlier today and just like I did on a previous scene on a previous day. A variable to keep track of something, a variable to keep track of something, code about tapping or interacting with something, code about interacting with something. In this case, it's this mini boss. mini boss function mini boss battle one but I probably by putting the number there I probably will have more than one mini boss to worry about so might as well name it uniquely we'll Boiler plate stuff. I also want to trace the boss hits. Time I hit the boss, show me in the output, I hit the boss. And every time I hit it, it'll increment the number in a moment. Um, and so this is going to show what's the boss hit points. But well, we've seen a way to add one to a variable before. Um, back when we were moving the painting, we tapped the painting and we kept track that when we moved it, when we nudged it three times, something happened. Every time we nudged the painting, we increased the variable by one. We've seen that before. So we'll do it again here. The name of the variable plus plus. So add one hit to the boss's HP. You know, HP is usually lowered, but we have we, we, we know what we're talking about. We just need a way to compare, a way to decide, has the boss been defeated? Have the hit points been altered, either lowered or raised to a certain point? And so in this case, we're starting. Now, if we were doing it the opposite way, let's say we wanted a boss of 100 hit points and we want to lower the hit points down to zero. Is there, is there a way to go the opposite way? This is known as incrementing, we're adding one. Is there a way to decrement going down? Yes, of course, there's minus minus. You do it that way. If that makes more sense logically to you, we start at 100 hit points, we wanna decrease them down to zero. We're gonna to have to change the if else equation later, but just to keep it the same way that we've learned it previously, to not throw too many things at you. We're starting from have not hit it, the boss yet, zero, and then add one hit until then we get to a limit. We reach the limit, then it's defeated. If the logic of it is better to go down, that's where the uh, change would be made, minus, minus. We can make a note uh, to decrement. We'll see here, increments to a limit. If instead we did Make sure this is a comment. We don't want to do both of these. It's decrement. Again, make sure it's a comment. If we say add one, then minus one, we, we end up with zero. Make sure this is commented if you're going to add this. And this, this is just for your notes. Decrements. Zero. Plus goes up, minus, minus goes down. All right, so let's see here. This boss is going to, I'm going to tap the boss to um, tap the boss to defeat it. But I just want to make sure, is my code correct so far? And as usual, it's good to pause and check your code every once in a while. Let's see here. Breaking in, going to the right, time limit. Oops, out the air. Okay, I think I know what it is. Uh, so it wants to keep track of the element, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, 
Okay, uh, we'll fix that in a way in a moment. Uh, so there's an error happening here. It's saying at this line, so my screen is cluttered up here. Let me show this. So I tried to go to the right screen and then it's popping up with an error. This is a very unhelpful error. Um, as soon as we get to the scene, so okay, type error, cannot access a property of method of null object reference, gibberish. This kind of message is telling you, and it also even pops over to line 29. It's saying, I can't run line 29 because this thing doesn't exist. Okay, the logic of it is, as soon as we get to fr frame one of this scene, as soon as we get to frame one of this scene, we're saying, let's set ourselves up to tap, to attack this boss. This boss doesn't exist until frame 10. So that's what the error it's trying to tell you there. That's a logic error, not a syntax error. So my code here, there's a boss on screen that I can interact with, is not correct in the right place. The code is correct, but it's not in the right place. The boss doesn't exist until frame 10. So either I can set up that the boss exists on frame one where the code exists, or I can set up that the code exists where the boss exists. Either or. And I think the way I want to do it is I will set up that the code will exist when the boss exists. So the code that I've got on the wrong frame, frame one, I need to move it to frame 10. Make some notes here in a moment. Let me just do this and confirm it, then I'll then I'll show you. Uh, this code I'm gonna um, cut it in a moment, and I'm going to move it to frame 10. I need a blank keyframe here. So F7, insert blank keyframe on frame 10. Here on frame 10 is where I've got the listener because here on frame 10 is where the graphic exists. The graphic didn't exist back on frame one, therefore the error was this code cannot be attached to that graphic. That graphic is not on frame one. Okay, I'll move the code to frame 10, where the graphic does exist. The code for the tapping is back on frame one, which should work. If not, we'll change it in a moment. Let me confirm this. So now, the, now the boss is tappable. Once the boss exists, once it's visible on frame 10. So again, it was fast, but let's check my output here. You are on the rightward path. The mini boss defeated, false. Mini boss battle is running. Boss hits one, two, three. So I managed seven hits within the time that it, before it killed me. The point of it is that it's working now. But you see here the complexity in terms of where the code exists. Let me back up to show that again. makes sense that on frame one, I've got my listener and then the code that runs, but it doesn't work in this case because of the boss doesn't exist until frame 10. So we need to make sure that we move the code there, not copy and paste. This will give an error. Even if the code is in both frame one and 10, it'll give an error because on frame one, it's wrong and frame 10, it's right. So on frame 10, I'm going to cut that, a copy, and I'm also going to make a note there, moved the listener. to frame 10. Boss exists, the graphic of the boss exists on frame 10, therefore the listener doesn't work here. I made a new blank keyframe on frame 10 when my boss graphic exists, and there is where I added it. You can make the note, because boss graphic exists here, listener is here.
Back on frame one, it loaded this part of the code into memory to keep track of battling the boss. Then on frame 10, it loaded the code to, to tap the boss and it kind of jumps back and remembers, oh, that code is back there. And then it increments and it traces. Saw that my output was showing that. eight hits that time. So part of the game could also be within a time limit, how many taps can you can you do? Uh, and not just to get to a limit, but it could be that you get between one and five taps, you get X number of HP. With between uh, six and 10 taps, you get that. Between 11 and 15, you get this. You can create levels of HP or whatever, XP. Um, also based on the uh, conditional statements. We might get to that later. The point here is that, okay, I'm setting up the mechanism that we're keeping track of hit points. We're adding to the hit points. All of that comes next here. Then check if boss has been battled enough. reach the limit, if we tap it 10 times versus if we don't tap it enough times, so we have another if else. If this is true versus it's false. either the boss is defeated or not. Of course, we could program it that when once we tapped it enough, suddenly, you know, uh, the boss starts to get bruises and we hit it even more. And then the, you know, uh, some hair falls off. Of course, we can do all of that. Um, we're doing it simple for the moment that it's just this or that. If we want nuance and levels of things, of course, it can be programmed. Uh, sometimes it's not just an answer about add this one line. Anything with programming that you can think of, you can do, but it may not be one line. It may be 10 lines. It may be 100 lines of code. But here's the part where we're checking these hit points. I'm going to make it obvious that it's very hard to defeat if it's greater than 100. I'm not going to be able to tap it 100 times in two seconds. You saw that I did seven one time and eight one time. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to do 100. I definitely want to, you know, test success and test failure. I'm definitely going to cause a failure here. I'm never going to be able to make that greater than 100 within the time limit. So I know uh, I'm going to see the, the else part. Now, eventually, I'll put this at a reasonable level, but I just want to see if this is, um, if the, if this, if else is working. It should, based on what we've previously done, this is another thing we've done a couple of times, if else, based on a variable. Oops. Syntax error, did I misspell my else? Oh yes, right here. I put an extra, I put a, see there, the semicolons mean end of statement which is wrong here. It's not the end, it's if else. That's the whole statement. Uh, so I accidentally put a semicolon there. My finger slipped. 
the whole command goes from line 37 to 41. Technically, the semicolon goes there. That's the end of the statement. But it gave me an error that I had a semicolon in the wrong place. You see, I double clicked the error and it took me directly to the spot of code that was wrong. So within two seconds, I have to tap the boss a few times just to make sure my output is doing what I think. So ignoring the result, my my code over here. So uh, you're at the main hallway, go to the right. I'm at the right hallway, mini boss defeated. Not yet, I just got to that screen. The battle code is running. I tapped it one time. Keep fighting, I haven't reached the limit yet. Okay, I tap it again. Keep fighting, you haven't reached the limit yet. Keep fighting, keep fighting. So I made it up to seven. I, I don't think I'll be able to tap it a hundred times in two seconds. But it is triggering the keep fighting. Triggering the else. This is not greater than that. Keep fighting. To make it super easy, I'm just going to put one. As long as I hit the boss one time, that'll trigger defeated. Should trigger defeated. Let's see. So I have to hit it at least once. This hits one. Oh, I put uh, greater than one. Whoops. Uh, I have to hit it at least greater than one. Greater, greater than or equal to one. So I didn't defeat it. I only tapped it once. One is not greater than one. False. So I should have put greater than or equal to. I should have put greater than zero. One is greater than zero. So I've got to play it again. So I'll tap it at least twice. Twice. There it is. Boss hits two. Boss is defeated. I'm still dead, of course, because I have to program it all. I'm slowly working through the logic of it. Hopefully, by the step by steps that we go through, the logic of it is the part that makes sense. Obviously, typing it all correct, you can just monkey see, monkey do, type it. It'll work. But more important for me, is that the logic of it makes sense. Not that you literally type the code correct, but that logically you understand the why of it. The how is easy to teach, type that, and you do this. The how is easy to teach. The why is a little harder to teach because it also requires a little bit of more the mentality of logic and um, computer, um, computer science and that sort of thing. So hopefully this is making sense. Okay, so after I hit the boss enough times, the whole point is to reverse uh, boss dead from true into, from, from false into true. At the beginning of this part of the game, boss is false, boss, boss is not dead. That will become true once I hit the boss enough, once I battle the boss enough, I've set up the way to detect, have I battled the boss enough? So I've got to flip that from false to true. Boss is defeated, change to true. And notice the syntax of that. It's not VAR dead colon boolean equals true. Whenever I have the VAR, it means create a variable brand new. I'm not creating a variable brand new. I'm using a previously created variable, the one back on line two or whatever. So the syntax should be like that. And again, don't also then say, okay, this is a boolean. We don't know, we no longer need to say what, what it's holding because when we created it on line two, we set up all of its parameters. Right now we're just using it. And here we've got a single equals. A single equal is 
take the thing on the right of the equal and put it into the thing on the left. If we have the double equal, it's compare the thing on the right with the thing on the left, which makes no sense here. I'm not trying to do an if else compare here. I'm doing an assignment. Um, assign what is on the right into what is on the left. So change to true, remove the mini boss sprite. Stop the timer, the timeline. That one's easy, just stop it. So it'd be better, uh, let's do it this way actually. Uh, on the main timeline, movie clip this root, stop. Once I've defeated the boss, set my variable to true, stop the timeline so that I don't trigger line, so that I don't trigger frame 50, so that I don't trigger game over. If I ever hit frame 50, it's game over. So stop my timeline here. And then also I want to remove the sprite of the mini boss. So on the main timeline, remove child, we saw that one last time. Um, when we picked up the key, want to remove that graphic from the screen, remove child. So from this main timeline, remove something from the screen. The something is the boss, the graphic of the boss. What if I first wanted to animate in its final death throes? Um, I would um, I would have in the timeline of the boss a part of an animation of the boss dying, and then when it gets to its final frame of dying in its timeline, I would add this remove part. So to say here, uh, first play a death animation, then remove sprite. That would be um, play the play the timeline of this symbol. So it should be here. Boss play. I don't have any animation there, so I'm putting it as a comment, but for those of you that want to be a little bit more advanced, if I first wanted to animate dying, uh, play the timeline of the boss. Um, maybe you have the boss itself kind of like, you know, moving around and animating, so it's going to have its own loop that loops within its time. Let's say you've got 100 frames. The first 50 frames are the animation of itself, you know, snarling, and then it's automatically looping within those first 50 frames. Once we've triggered here, true, it's dead. Okay, then jump us to frame, you know, 51 of the boss's timeline. Frame 51 is where it starts the animation of death. And then when it gets to frame 100, frame 100 is where it's got remove its graphic from the screen. Say, or this will be to do, we'll do this later. So dead to true, we remove the clickability of that boss from the screen. We stop the timeline so we never trigger frame 50. Let's see. Oh, and then that'll also, that'll also then relate to the go to the end. It's dead. Let us move forward. Don't let us move forward.
So here we go. We have two seconds to at least tap it twice. We know that death will happen. We've, we've programmed death easily. Timer runs out very quickly. Um, to defeat it, I have to do it quickly. We'll put a more reasonable time later. Let's see here if I can do it in two taps, in two seconds. Yep. All right, so within the two seconds, I tapped it fast enough. The timeline stopped. It's not going to hit 50. The scenes, boss is defeated. So if I tap the door, I go to the good ending, which I don't have anything there yet, but I'm at the good ending. I was not able to open the, the door until I um, defeated the boss. All of this code here is, of course, one of a hundred different ways to do something like this. There's a time limit. You must battle the boss. This is version one of the boss. It's not based on anything else. Have I picked up the fire sword and whatever? Am I, does, does, the, does the character class of my fighter let me defeat the boss faster than the mage? Of course, there's a hundred things we could add to this. But little by little. Or test, then we will take a break. This is again happening way too fast. To slow it down, add more time. The way I will do this is I will just add more frames in between 10 and 50. That's two seconds, way too fast. If I select, click and drag to select all of those layers, and on all of them I add F5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 24. I just added one more second, right? 24 frames per second. I just added one second. That animation now takes from frame 10 to 75. So I've added one more second. If I want to do this faster, you can select more than one frame. If I select two frames at a time and I F5, I'm going to add two frames at a time. Instead of click, instead of tapping F5 24 times, I only need to tap it 12 times because I'm adding two frames at a time every time I F5 one time. If I select five frames, every time I F5, I'm going to add five frames. Wait, I'm going to add some amount of extra time. I'm going to put it up to 100. I have about four seconds to defeat the boss. Just adding more frames. The point of that also is I want to show that if I try to open the door, what if I try to run past the creature? Well, I have a little bit more time now because it's going to come at me a little slower. But the door is locked until I defeat the creature. If I try to go through the door, it's going to say, nope, boss is not defeated yet. Boss is floating at me a little slower. Time. Timer ran out. This time it ran out on frame 100 instead of 25. 75 frames slower. Code is the same. I didn't change anything about the code. It is just the time in between uh, the timer starting and the timer ending. So, Ending, we're about to take a break, but the good ending, I just want to add something good here. Found the pot of gold. sack of gold. Obviously, in the grand scheme of it all, this game is very short so far. 
but we're trying to learn all of the ingredients and concepts and pieces and then combine them in many different ways where we, we got to a screen where it's either death or success. Um, of course, I should probably make it keep going to more towards the right side of the house. But uh, for the moment, if I go to the right and I do defeat the boss in time, boss is defeated, can go forward. Game. From win the game here, okay, what do I do? Do I play again, second quest, exit the game? If I were to die, well, what do I do when I go to the death screen? Play again, exit the game. Again, we've got still plenty to do. But we're setting up the basics first. And now that I've got four seconds to defeat the boss, now the hit points are way too low. So this is where you're balancing it. Um, in my case, now I've got 100 frames to defeat the boss, four seconds. So probably I also want this to be a little bit higher. I don't know if 11 is too high. I'm just putting some amount of values. So if I go greater than 10, or 10 or more, greater than or equal to, if I was doing it the opposite way, counting down, well, I would start that up at 100. I would have the decrement happening instead of the increment. And then, okay, if you're less than or equal to zero hit points, that's now going downwards. Logically, that might set, make sense for a lot of people. I want to do it opposite logic. So we're going to have as long as you're greater than because you are incrementing. Because you're starting from zero, you weak limit, you flip that to true, you remove the boss from the screen, you stop the timeline. And then the other code about can I open the door? Well, if boss true is dead, then yeah, go to the next scene or else nothing happens. Later, I'll play a sound. It's our mini boss scene. Let's take our break here. Uh, 120, we'll take a break until 130. We have a left hallway to go through. Other things we can do, like with the um, that key and then adding input name for your character and a lot of other stuff are from our to-do list. At 1.30.
right, let's go on. So the um, left hallway, there's more we can do. There's more we will do on the right hallway for the moment. But here we're introducing a bad ending versus a good ending. For the left hallway, we'll also do something similar. Good ending, bad ending, based on something on screen. Obviously, we want to go deeper into the house and explore more. But I want to get done some of the basic animation. Then we'll the next week we're definitely going to work on adding sound. Let's see how does our timeline look. Next week I want to start to add some sound. I think it's just plenty of time. We're actually on track very well. So next week will be sound, background music, and sound as as you interact with elements. And we've got about two weeks or so. So then we'll go back and add some of the to do items and other requests and polish and stuff. So it'll feel a little short when it's all done for the moment, it'll feel a little short from what we'll do on the lecture, not a whole lot of screens to go through. But once you understand how to move from screen to screen and do interactivity on screen, you can then further add more paths. But another thing I wanna add before that, before the more screens and, and more plot, on the left, okay, the idea of the left side is that, um, again, there's a doorway at the end of the hallway. This one, though, requires you to pick up the right key. Now, I know we have the key from the, um, the skull key, but as I said, that skull key, because it's hidden behind the painting, I'm going to set it up plot-wise. That skull key is for a side quest elsewhere. So... Let's assume that a person never found that key behind the painting. So on this screen, there's going to be some keys that appear on the ground. And every time a person plays the game, the keys will be in a different position. Randomness. How do you make things appear randomly on the screen? We're going to couple it also with a time limit. Also the time limit of... Uh, in this case, spikes are going to pop out from the walls. If you don't get the right key within the time limit, the spikes get you, they take you to the bad ending. If you do get the right key, then you can proceed. Now, again, the challenge here is that every time you play the game, the uh, the keys will be in a different place. So, so if you're trying to memorize... Um, well, it's always going to be the key uh, on the on the middle side. Well... It's going to vary every time you play. So we'll have random, random stuff happening. It's part of the game. So we're going to set up a um, key. Three different keys. And I'm going to use the same sprite, similar to the buttons back on the first scene. Uh, this time we will see one symbol will have three keys, and then we will display the correct key on this screen. I'm going to draw a super simple cartoon key like that. at least one one key turn that into a symbol oops I actually should do this on its own interactive layer lock my non-interactive layer the key there Turn that into a symbol. So F8 on that, S, P, left, keys. This one symbol will have three or five or ten, whatever number of different keys. Instead of making ten different symbols, there will be ten keys in one symbol. Um, this is the inst instance name, of course. 
but we're doing we're going to do this differently. The keys, I'm not going to put three keys on the screen manually. I'm going to write code that can look in the library, grab the key from the library, put it on screen through code, and put it in random places through code. So this is going to be different here. It's not going to be all of the keys all already there at runtime. It's going to be generative. They're going to generate and different every time. So I made a key, but I don't want a copy of it on the timeline yet. I made, I mean, in the library. Need a little bit of setup. This is brand new. In order for Action Script to know, to look at, to be able to look into the timeline and grab a copy of a thing and put it on screen, we sort of need a um, an instance name in the library, sort of. When we have something on screen and we go to its properties, we set the instance name. We've seen that before. In the library, we, we kind of add an instance name. It's actually more, it's known as linkage. You might see right here within the um, the uh, the columns of your library, like on mine, you know, it's all the way to the right here, so you didn't notice it. But if you grab the column there and pull it over, oh, this is so showing a few different things as well that I never realized. You know, my screen is smaller than yours probably, but if I had my library that large, I would see all of these things. Uh, what type of symbol is it? We've got three types. When was it modified? When did you last edit it, right? And then we've got a use count. This particular item has been used three times throughout my project. The keys at the moment have been used zero. The mini boss has been used twice at the beginning and at the end of the animation. So that is a column of linkage and all of these are empty. So the complication of what we're about to do here, we need to add a linkage instance name to the library and then the code can grab it from the library and put it on screen. The way we do that is we can either double click the symbol of the left keys. Sorry, not double click, uh, right click. You can right click. You can also click on the info icon down there, properties. If you right click in your library and you go to properties, which is the same as selecting it and clicking info properties icon, that brings us back to the screen where we originally gave it a name, gave it a type, but now we're gonna go into the advanced panel here, advanced part of the panel. And here's a bunch of advanced stuff. The only one that matters for the moment is this section right here, action script linkage, export for action script. This is basically saying allow, action script allow the code to access this item from the library. We need to enable this. Then it fills in a few things for us. Export on frame one. It's automatically on and I would leave it on. So this is basically let myself be able to use this library item starting on frame one if I choose. That is perfectly fine to leave it on, even though I'm going to use it on frame 50, just leaving it on is fine. Class, base class. Okay, base class, never change that. That is very, 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 very advanced. Never change that. Class, you may change if you wish or leave it as is. That is going to be the instance name, so to speak. Uh, so don't do this, but watch this. If I turn on actions and change nothing and then click OK, it's going to pop up to say, hey, this doesn't exist. Would you like to create it? Just click OK. And then what happens is now this has linkage. Now this has an instance name. Now I can write JavaScript that references this library item. I, don't, I cannot write JavaScript to access the gate. It has no linkage. And so to add linkage, I go to its properties and turn on that, turn on that uh, check mark. The, the name that it gives it here is the name is the same name as the as the library item and you could leave it as is that will work fine or you can do what we've been doing with our instance names and you change the name just a little bit 
I will do that just to kind of keep it the same way as my other instance names, where it, when it's in the library, it has the prefix, for example, of SP, Sprite. And then when it's an instance, um, I change the name slightly. So you can keep it as is or change it. You can call it kitty cat. It can be anything. It'll then say, a definition for this class could not be found, so one will automatically be generated. Yeah, there's nothing here. This is not an error or anything. Just click OK. You can tell it, don't remind me, because every time you add linkage to anything, it'll say the exact same thing. If you want it to stop bothering you, click that and click OK. Don't click cancel. It, nothing will work if you click cancel. You want to click OK. Now that has an instance name. If I wanted to do something for the front door, don't do this. But if I wanted to do it for the front door, same thing. I go to the advanced, I turn that on, give it some name, and then now that is accessible via ActionScript. Want accessible via JavaScript at the moment is my bundle of keys. One key, I gave it an instance name, a linkage name. This one graphic, this one symbol, will have my... Um, three different keys, one that looks like this, one that's got, you know, Lucky Clover on it, one that is all rusty, one that's made out of steel. Now we could do that later when I get more advanced. One is, one is a copper key, a steel key, a gold key. The way I do that is when I edit the symbol, then I draw the different keys. So on layer one, Frame one, that's one key. Frame two, I'm gonna draw a new key. Let's see, this one's gonna be maybe more like that. It'll be something like this. Just a different looking key. So one key that's like that, one key that is like that. I'm not animating it. I'm just making different designs of keys. And when you think about it, well, how many ways can a key look like? Well, this one's going to look like diamond head. Key, another key, another key. Okay, so I've got a library item with three keys, 20 keys, whatever. I've got linkage set to that library item. I want the code to grab a copy of that key and put it on screen. When my code of the left scene, variable to store all keys from the library. AR, call this whatever we will call this. P01 colon. Okay, previously we created a variable, we want to store a number here. Okay, or we create a variable, we want to store a Boolean here. What else previously? We created a rectangle. This one's going to be brand new. This is based on the linkage. On the linkage, create a variable that holds keys. 
linkage name, very important. Whatever linkage I gave it in the library is my data type. This colon means data type. Store a number, store a rectangle, store uh, a name. No, store a an item from the library, basically. Uh, an instance of a thing with a uh, data type. It is equal to a new copy of the keys, parentheses. So new syntax here. Get a variable to store all keys. Okay, uh, data type. So we have a colon, the data type. Said of number or Boolean or etc. based on linkage. And in big letters to remind you, that is not something you make up on your own. That is based on what linkage did you write in the library. Then on, after the equals part, we have new and then left keys parentheses. That is uh, syntax, meaning the object of key, uh, the object in the library. That's that's a syntax. Um, if I create it later on, we're going to do this later on. Don't do this. Later on, we're going to say uh, main music, and then we're going to say you know, uh, Star Wars soundtrack number one equal to new Star Wars one like this. So later on, let's say we want to borrow some Star Wars music. We'll put that MP3 file into our library. We give it linkage. And then we're going to create a variable that is going to hold our main music. And that's coming from the library with my linkage of Star Wars 1. And then a new instance of that item from the library. So when we do music, we're going to see something like that, a variable that holds music. We've seen a variable that holds numbers, that holds true false. Here's a variable that's holding your keys, graphics. Here's a variable that's going to hold your music later. We're not on music yet. That's next week. But the syntax is going to look like that. Make sure this matches that, and the difference also here is parentheses. Why? That's the syntax. That's just the way it works. Play that instance on screen. So we have in the main timeline this root. Add a child. Hey, we saw remove child previously. When the painting fell down, the key was on screen. Pick up the key. Well, remove it off of the screen. Put it in inventory. Remove it off of the screen. That was remove child. The opposite of remove is add in this case. Um, so add child. And child is just the term you often hear in programming languages. Uh, uh, you know, in addition to what is already there is a child in, in addition, the next thing. So on the main timeline, let's add something on screen. Now something on screen is this key, is this theoretical variable. It's floating around in memory, but now let's put it on screen. Well, now that it's on screen, we can control various things about it, such as its X and Y coordinates. Everything on the screen has coordinates. It's moved down seven spots. It's moved over 300 spots. It's coordinates somewhere on screen, X and Y. We'll put some random values for the moment. We'll put real values in a moment because I want to see it. I want to see my hard work here. I drew a, I drew a key. I put it in my library. I gave it linkage. I referenced it as a variable. I put that reference on the screen and I put it in specific coordinates. Confirm all of this works. We have things to fine tune. You just see my code isn't wrong. So if I go start, walk in, break in, go left. So out of the library, onto the screen, at coordinates x100 and y100, 
there's the object. Now it's all wiggling and floating and such for various reasons. It's wiggling around because that symbol has three frames. Frame one, key one, frame two, key two, frame three, key three. Well, obviously the, the frames are gonna play automatically unless you stop them. And number two, it's floating in the air because my coordinates, well, the floor is down here. And X and Y, okay, X is left and right. So X, I moved to the right 100, Y is up and down, Y, I moved 100 down. So 100 to the right, 100 down, there's the key. Well, I'm gonna have to move it over to the right some amount right here, that's probably 100, but then move it down a lot, that's probably 400. So I want a key to appear somewhere right there. And I want it to stop animating, right? Now I can add stop as we've done previously in the symbol, but how about this instead? Um, I say that key one, go to and stop frame one. I could add the stops within the, add the stops within the um, symbol, but I can also add stops within code. But now it's not gonna animate through its three frames. It's gonna go to and stop at frame one. And it, but obviously if I put frame three, go to frame three, show me key three, I might as well run it. And so that's something very cool we can do via code that if there's multiple items within the object, we can then specify which of those frames do we show. We did that with, with one of the buttons there actually already. So we're going back to something we've previously done. Anyway, now it's key three, that's easy. So uh, display it on screen, set the key one coordinates from the top left. The, what, the numbers that you pick start from the top left. Um, at the very, very top left over here is, um, up here is zero, zero. So we have X and Y, X is left and right. Positive values of X is to the right. So if I want to put something here, okay, well, my my uh, ruler tells me around 650 or so. And then if I need it to be here, well, downwards of Y is somewhere around over here. What does it show? That's around 350. So if I needed something to be at a very specific place right here, I figure out the X and the Y coordinates. I want my key to appear somewhere within the path over here. Do I want it way far away over here visually in my drawing, or do I want them within a sort of a boundaries area over here? In my case, I kind of want them somewhere around over here. In my case, anywhere between zero and what is that there, 400. I'm gonna make a note of this for myself. Everyone's gonna be a little bit different. And then downwards, the stop, the top most point is somewhere at 400, between 400 and the very bottom is 480. Case between zero and 400, between zero and 400, and between 400 and 480, somewhere around here is what I want. If you want them in different places, you figure out your coordinates. You can view your rulers via view rulers. I code, I said somewhere between there and there, I'm gonna say moved over to the right a little bit, 100 units, then I've gotta move it down 400 units. Let me show only frame one of the keys show only the first key. To get deeper and deeper into the game, yep, you've got to do this whole dance of reloading your code and playing through your own game. There's a way, of course, to program in a cheat code to jump further in. It's fast enough, so okay.
that's it's more in the area that I want it. Good. I'll leave this as an example of specifically setting an item exactly in a certain place on screen. I want to randomly generate more than one key and randomly put them on the screen. So we'll say here, example, of specifically putting an putting a library item on screen. Example of putting a specific library item versus examples of putting a random library item randomly on screen. Okay, we'll say first, generate some random numbers. Programming languages have a way to generate a random number, and I need some random numbers. I need some random numbers that exist within the boundaries here. So uh, separately, this is just for me. Uh, again, I want to have a little bit of a, of a box. I'm going to delete this later. This box right here is um, where I want my keys to appear. So, as I said, between zero ish and 400, up to bottom between 400 and 480 ish. My random numbers, I, I need to pick a for X and Y. For X, I need to pick a random number between zero and 400. And for Y, I need to pick a random number between 400 and 480. First, generate some random numbers. VAR, create a brand new variable to keep track of something. Call this RND, random, uh, random 2x. I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, that'll be a data type number. I also want a variable uh, for RND 2y number. It's okay for my second key. I've already set up a way to. For my first key, I'm going to lock it in there always at these coordinates. Uh, for my key two, three, four, five, I'm going to have random numbers. For, so my second key, x coordinate, my second key, y coordinate, I'm going to create some random numbers. They're assigned, those are equal to math.random. There's a built in command to create a random number. Now the problem here is it's gonna create a random number between zero and one. Let's see how many possibilities between zero and one? Well, actually it'll also do fraction. So if you tell it between zero and one, well, it might give you 0 0.25 or 0 0.1 or 0 0.00001 or 0 0.11119. So it can make a million random numbers between zero and one, but that doesn't make sense. I need a random number between 0 and 400 for x. My case, the way I drew mine. And on y, between 400 and 80. So the way to tell it to go to a certain range is to multiply. and the number between zero and 10. It's in my case, between zero and 400.
whenever it makes a random number, it's usually going to be also as a fraction. I don't want fractions. I want whole numbers. So I can round off the number. Instead of 1.9, it gives me 2. Instead of 1.1, it gives me 1. It rounds off the number. So I need to back up for a moment here. Math dot round, which has parentheses. But if if I type math dot round 3.9, the result will be 4. It's 3.2, it'll be 3. It's 3.6, it'll be 4. Right? It's just going to do the common random, it's the count, the common rounding up or down. 0 0.9 will round up to 1. 0 0.09 will round down to 1. Um, actually, uh, 0. So I want it to generate a random number, which will be a fraction, and then that round it to a whole number. So that part of the equation needs to be inside of the parentheses here. So I'm going to round a number. Which number? The number that I get from first generating random number between 0 and x, and then round it up or down so that it's a whole number. The point is I want a whole number. Same thing with the x and y. I mean the y, but I know I'm starting it as math.round. Inside of that, I'll space it out just to make it readable. Then I'll clean up the space. Inside of that, generate a random number, search from zero, and it goes up to, in my case, 480. Now, the problem here is that if I want zero to 400, this is fine, because it's going to assume zero up to 400 from 0 to 400. Easy. This one is assuming from 0 to 480. But I want from 400 to 480. If I select 0, if I let it select 0, it's going to be up on the ceiling, not within the area down here. I need to start at least at 400, at boundary. So the logic is, that calculation, then add 400. So let's assume that it generated zero. Well, zero's up on the top. I don't want zero. I want to start at 400. So zero plus 400 will start me at the minimum right there. Have to then further change. Okay, well, what if it what if it perfectly generated four eighty? Okay, four eighty plus four hundred will be eight eighty. Um, that's going to go outside of the game. So now our maximum isn't that we're going to go to the maximum of four eighty. We know we're starting at at least four hundred. So it's not that we need a number between four hundred and four eighty. It's we need a number. Um, for, from 400 up to 80 more. So we change our code a little bit just to say that. So if it generates zero, zero plus 400 is 400. It starts at the minimum. If it managed to then generate 80, okay, 80 plus 400 is 480. It gets me to my maximum. That's how I do a, that's how I do a range between 400 to 480. What's... What's the math that I have to add to it? So yeah, this, this is one of the confusing things, the many confusing things we've been learning here because now we've introduced math. And actually math works a lot more in games than you think. Um, this is the first time we're dealing with any math stuff, but when you deal with a full game, you're gonna work with a lot of math and some of this random number stuff uh, so that the boss isn't always standing behind the same column before it attacks you, 
you have to randomly pick one of your three columns. And so random numbers are very valuable. All that we're doing here is generating a number so that eventually x equals something, y equals something. So here's a number we're generating, numbers that we're generating. In order to use these numbers, we then need to create a new instance of, uh, of a key, key2, which is based on the library linkage item. Create a new copy of that in memory. Place it on screen. Set its coordinates. Display key two. We set it, set its coordinates. That's based on these random numbers I just generated. Play key two. I mean, go to and stop key two. That's 99, this right here is 99% exactly the same what I did up here. Get a copy of it, put it on the screen, set its coordinates, play the first key. Create an instance of it, place it on screen, set its coordinates, play the second key. The difference here is now randomly within boundaries, we are setting up where are the coordinates. And so it will think of different coordinates every time we get to the screen. Obviously not on this one because we didn't randomize anything. We said at exactly 100 by 400, put that key. And over here, we're saying, think of a number and put them there. Let's see. So that key there is always there. This one ended up being there on that corner. That's my second key, the one that was a little bit of an angle. I restart the game, so memorize that in this playthrough, that key is on that corner. Obviously, I'm going to delete this box, but I'm just setting up the box to show that I want boundaries. If I re-debug my game, I'm going to go back to that particular scene right there. We'll see how the random generator will generate Again, random uh, locations. So let's see here. Go here, go here, break in, oops, break in, go left. Slightly different. Doing it over and over, it's going to pick all of these different areas somewhere there. I'm not going to go through each generation of it, but it picked a different spot. Well, now that I know trick randomly setting things up. Okay, I have a third key I want to show. I'm going to set up that one exactly the same, except for one little difference. So the same the same thing there. I'm just going to copy this whole chunk and make a few changes. I again need to generate x and y coordinates for my third key. I instead need to create an instance. Uh, can you make sure the door doesn't lock? You, you, you locked it right there. And so we're going to generate a new instance of the key and then put it on the screen and put its coordinates and stop it on three. So might as well copy the same code again. I know this worked. We just need to make sure you're setting the proper things here. If you copy and paste, don't forget to make the changes. Now it's random number three and it's random number three and it's key three and it's key three we're putting on screen and it's key three where X coordinates and it's key three of Y coordinates. And it's key three of the sim of the instance, and it's frame three of the of the key. I had three keys in the one symbol. Oops, don't forget here. And then it's random three and random three. Three, 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 three. That's why I put those numbers there easily. Try to remember easily.
There we go. Key one, two, three. The one that never changes, the, the two and the three that did change. I come back to the screen again. I should program moving back and forward, but I have to do the restart instead. They go back to that left side, randomly there, there. There's the second key, there's the third key. Key one, always in the same place. Add a third key and make it clickable. So the point of this particular screen is we will have three or five or six or whatever keys appear randomly on screen. Only one of those keys is the correct key to then be able to um, exit the, the, the screen. There's going to be a time limit in a moment that spikes will appear. But key one is not clickable. Key two is not clickable. I'm going to make key three the clickable one. I could make all three clickable, but then one of them is the correct clickable one for version one of this. I'm going to make one of the keys is clickable. Three. And even though we've only got three items and one is clickable, one out of three, they're going to jump around to different parts of the game. I mean, different parts of the floor. So it'll still be random enough to give a challenge. Uh, to make it clickable, we need an event listener. Do it on this line here, where on the timeline, add that graphic on screen and add event listener. So this is slightly different than we've seen before where we had, you know, main door ad event listener. All of this part right here, sort of, you can think about it as what we've seen before. There's an instance name of an object on screen, add a listener. Well, we're saying first put that instance on the screen and then add the event listener. That is valid as well. And for this to be complete, it needs the rest of the code about this is tappable, and then we run a function. So we've had a touch event, dot touch tap, comma run some code, fn, uh, get left key. Key three is listening. It's listening for a tap. Once we tap it, run the code, get left key. Like we've seen before, we're going to run some sort of function after some sort of interactivity. So an event here of type touch event. Here we'll break this apart to note this is the end of our particular code. Place it. This is our message. 
do here to do stop the spikes. This screen is going to have a time limit where spikes are coming at you within the time limit. Uh, we're going to stop the spikes. It's going to be very similar to the boss, but I'll just do it as a to-do item for the moment. If we picked up the correct key, the um, spikes will stop. That key will allow me to open the door. If I try to open the door without that key, it won't let me. Set this up is... Actually, I want to change my notes here because... Based on the previous semester, we're going on a good pace. So I think I want to change this a little bit. Um, okay, I'll put some to-do items because we're getting close to the end of the day as well. Uh, we're going to say here, uh, pick up the right key. We'll do that next time. We can set this up in a few ways. Uh, we can do that. Okay, there's three keys. Person could try to grab each one and move it onto the door within the time limit. Or a person can just go and reach out to grab the right one. It would make more sense as a sort of a real game by trying to pick up the right key and touching it to the door. So that'd be more hit detection, just like the, the rock versus the window. Um. That means we need to set up event listeners for all three keys and and bounding boxes and all that stuff. So I don't, I, I think for the moment, I don't want to do this as pick up the key to, to, to touch the door. Um, it's just going to be grab the right key. That'll trigger something. Maybe we should do it that they appear on pedestals. You know, now we're thinking too hard in terms of a real game. Um, they're all, all three keys on different pedestals. You grab the right one, the pedestal triggers the whatever. Um, it'll just be, we'll grab the, the key, stops the spikes, and then takes us to the next screen. But on next time, we will add more of an animation. But for the moment, simply, so we'll do here, to do, uh, add a uh, moving uh, animation. For the moment, though, we'll just go uh, move to the correct screen. It's frame one of the scene and good. Should be good for the moment. Okay, so these keys will appear randomly on the ground. One of them is clickable. So I removed my little box. I don't need it anymore. Uh, so three things appeared. The first key over here is not clickable. The second key is not clickable. The third key is clickable. So you saw the output there. Um, get that key is running. And then it, to the good ending. Notice, hey, the keys are still there. So even though I moved over to another whole different screen, those sprites are still there. Well, computers are dumb. I've moved to another screen. Why is it still showing graphics from my previous screen? Computers are dumb. We didn't program it to remove those graphics. So, okay, how to program that. I try to get the key. 
I want to go to the next scene before or after, but probably before. Let's remove those keys from on screen so that when we then go to the next scene, they're no longer there. On the main timeline, and key two, and key three, each one of these, I want to remove child. It's backwards. Um, on the main timeline, I want to remove child something three times. Errors, I then say key one, key two, key three. Child, remove child, very powerful. It can create things on screen. It can remove things from screen. Remove the three keys. Us to the next screen. Right, so we know that it's always the third key. Of course, further program it that randomly one of those keys will be the correct one. I'll put that on the to-do list. Right now, for testing purposes, the important part is, can we put things on screen randomly in the right place? We got it. We created random X, Y coordinates. We got an item out of the library, put it onto the screen via linkage. Version one of this, one of them is clickable. It's that one. The keys disappear, and then we go to the next scene. Well, obviously, as someone plays the game, that would make perfect sense. Why do I still see the keys on the next scene? But we needed to program it. So the computer doesn't... Um, or doesn't know to what you want until you program it to do what you want. Find a function for picking up the right random key, blah, blah, blah. Remove dynamically generated generated keys from on screen then move to the next scene I had said also here maybe a to do item to randomly pick the right key so that not every time it's the third key We've programmed it. This is known as hard coding it. There's dynamically coded and hard coded. I've hard coded that only key three is clickable. I've dynamically coded, make up some random coordinates. And of course we can random, we can dynamically code it that this time you play it's key one. Next time you play it's key three. Next time you play it's key one. We can do that next time. It just requires more setup, more math, more, more setup. Whatever we can do, basically, whatever we can think of to do to add to our game, it can be done. It just is uh, based on um, what's our time within the uh, class and what's, um, what's our time limits and how complex something is. And as I said, again, in this case, it's simply we click it and suddenly we move to the next screen. Wouldn't it be better that we have some kind of animation? Would it be better that we pick up the key and put it to the door? Yeah, all that can be done. Um, I think it'll be too much effort if you try to do that. Each key, is, each key you can pick up and put it by the door. We've done it before with the rock in the window. We could do it again with the key, of course. It's 99% the same, the same code. The point here is that I want random stuff on screen. And we didn't even sit, we don't have time just yet to set up the death 
part of it. It's going to be very similar to the boss. There's going to be some, uh, the mini boss. It's going to be some amount of time that passes. And instead of a boss coming at you, it's going to be spikes that are going to start to appear within the, the scene, slowly coming at you. Obviously, when we reach a certain time limit, frame 100 or whatever, if it doesn't, if you don't get the right key, the right random key within the time limit, okay, we're going to trigger the code bad ending. We do get the right key. If we do pick the right random key, it's always number three. But if we further program it, it could be one of those three. If we do get the right key, we're going to stop the spikes. Then we'll further animate the success of, of this. Maybe the, maybe the spikes will retract. And you can see it right here. As soon as we pick up the key, we, we go to the, to the good ending. We can do anything, of course. It's just a matter of time. And for today, well, we're at the end of the day for today's lecture. But at this point, we, um, we're, we're adding version one of these brand new screens. A little mini boss coming at you within a time limit. It's got a hit points. You need to hit the hit points to the right level before you can open the door. If you don't do that within the time limit, you get to the bad ending. If you do do it within the right ending, I mean, within, within the right time limit, you can open the door. If you go to the left side, randomly generated objects appear on screen. If you pick the right one within the time limit, you can go to the exit. So, lecture-wise, I will upload my example code, and then um, the videos, of course. We'll do a little lab time. We we'll want to stay and work. Quick reminder on the homework. Basically, again, you are adding your to your project. You're making it work um, based on last week's code. What we're learning today about the random keys and the mini boss, you don't have to add any of that to this homework. It's just all the way up to what we learned last week. Make sure those concepts, which are all delineated here, make sure all those concepts are part of your game due on Tuesday with your graphics. This week, we'll wrap up the this particular scene here, the death part of it. Then we'll start to add music. I want actual music to play within my game. Um, when that music stuff is done, we then also need... Uh, well, if I get to the bad ending, this is a dead end at the moment. Do I want to restart the game? Do I want to exit the game? If I get to the good ending, do I want to restart the game, the second quest? Do I want to exit the game, etc.? So once we reach these screens, do something. That's the goal for the for the next week. Um, then we'll have about two weeks there where we're going to go back and add in the various items of our of polishing things up that we had over here that we we had requested there's our requests character select um, inventory even better cutscenes username inputs on screen movement stuff and the to do items that i added here on as well so we're on track so far. It's time for you then to turn in what you have working so far by Tuesday uh, to make sure it's on track.